Well, Larry, uh, hello. Nice. And it's, <laughs> it's great to be in, uh, in the UK and great to be in Nottingham. Mm -hmm. I think I'm saying that correctly now. Mm -hmm. My U.S. accent wants me to say Nottingham or Birmingham, right. but it's Nottingham. So. Nottingham. Um, let's introduce ourselves. Sure. How about we start with you? Sure. Um, well, I'm Larry Reagan. I'm the director of a new center at Penn State University in the States in Pennsylvania. Uh, our center is called the Center for Online Innovation and Learning. And uh, a little later on, I'd like to talk about the center and some of the things I've seen with ALT. Um, I've been with Penn State for going on 30-some years now in a variety of uh, capacities. And um, almost always in the area of adult education, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and I'd say for the last 20-some uh, years of that uh, around instructional technology. So it's been a, a wonderful career uh, experience for me being at Penn State. And um, I'm most excited now about this new center, as well as our relationship, which is uh, one of the more uh, pleasurable things I get to work on, which is uh, with Sloan C. We'll hear a second from you. Uh, but Penn State's relationship to Sloan C, and in particular the Leadership Institute, and uh, we can chat a little bit about that. So hopefully Bruce, we can swing back to that. Who you, are you? And you didn't mention the Creamery. Oh, the ice Some cream. Some of the creamery. best ice cream in the world, oh, uh, right you. there in State yeah. College. I wish I can take some credit for that. State but we College, do have, PA. We have great ice cream. Um, Thank you. And I'm Bruce Shalou. I'm Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of an organization called the Sloan Consortium. We are. Uh, 20 years old, roughly the same age as our colleagues here in the UK, uh, ALT. Uh, a professional society organization focused on the integration of online learning into the mainstream of higher education, both in the US but globally. Uh, spent a lot of time focused on quality, quality assurance. How do we make sure for institutions and the students who utilize uh, online courses and programs that they're getting a quality product? Uh, trying to expand the community, uh, focused on research activities. Uh, and with you and colleagues at Penn State have moved very uh, quickly over the last now almost six years into uh, a focus on leadership and online learning because as anyone who's watching this can see, we're not getting any younger. Yeah. But of course they're not getting any younger <laughs> either. So, uh, well, uh, and we think that the, the there are going to be some real leadership challenges as more and more folks move to uh, online strategies, both in institutions, but also more students uh, seek online learning. Bruce, if you don't mind, maybe I'll, I'll lead off with a question about Sloan C, because uh, at least in the States, and I, and I think this is growing internationally as well, there's a recognition that that collection of institutions and individuals has really uh, helped to galvanize the, um, as you said, the research, the development, the exploration of this online environment. Now, I happen to know that you've been with Sloan C uh, in a variety of capacities for all, I think, the whole 20 years, if not pretty darn close. My question for you is what, what changes have you seen in the organization over that, that span of time? Uh, about 10, actually. I, I, okay. I attended meetings prior to that. Our, our similar ALT conference, the one we're at now, is uh, it, we'll hold our 19th annual uh, conference in November. Um, I think I attended one of the first five or six, then kind of moved away. But over the last 10 years, I don't think I've missed a beat. Uh, I served uh, as an advisor to uh, uh, the program officer, Frank Mayados, at the Sloan Foundation, who, was, who we view as the father of uh, the consortium. And uh, when we became a, uh, in U.S. terms, a 501c3, a nonprofit charitable, if you will, organization, I think is the term that they use here in the U.K., we, um, we established a board. Frank asked me if I would take leadership of the board early on. And somehow I was reelected twice. Mm -hmm. So for uh, about four years, three and a half, close to four years, served as the president of the board. But it's, it was really a chair position, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then left the board to take this new position, the position I'm currently in, um, and have been in that for um, about a year and a half. Now, so back to your question because I, I filled in some blanks. Uh, I, I think the changes have been dramatic, and in some measure, um, 
that is due to three things. One, the, clearly in the U.S., the immersion, the, 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 the movement and the, and the growth, if you will, of uh, the immersive nature was where I was going to go with that, of, uh, of e-learning or online learning. Uh, it has moved from kind of off on the side of most institutions. That's probably not the case at Penn State with your structure with the World Campus. But really into the into the kind of the mainstream, the thinking, uh, strategic thinking. Secondly, ten years ago, I, I think one of the more uh, brilliant uh, activities of the consortium was uh, conducting an annual survey on online learning. And a colleague of ours, Jeff Seaman, uh, and the Babson Survey Research Group conducted that survey. We didn't have ten years, so this year's re this past mm -hmm. year's report was terrific because it gave us a ten year kind of trend analysis. But I think we have kind of witnessed the growth over that 10-year period. Uh, and it's also given us an insight by polling more than 3,000 institutions every year, their chief academic officers. Where does all of this kind of sit? Uh, and I could go through too many statistics. Just one I would mention, three quarters of all colleges and universities in the U.S. that are surveyed have indicated that e-learning or online learning mm -hmm. is of strategic importance to them in, in, in their future. So if you think about that, um, I mean, over 3,000 institutions, there's only a small sliver, about 10 percent, and we think, and we, in fact we know, those are primarily independent, smaller, sure. single-purpose institutions, sure. uh, very traditional and campus-based, that do not have uh, e-learning or online mm -hmm. learning as a significant part of their future strategy. So we've seen that shift. And then the third shift, and then I'll let you comment, uh, it, it really speaks to what we've been doing with leadership. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we've seen a significant change in the nature of folks who are coming into online e-learning, many of them not through the traditional faculty channels that we came through, uh, and then maybe into administrative positions. Uh, and secondly, um, a far greater understanding of kind of where the field is right now, and then we're trying to kind of blend and mold them into uh, taking taking all of us to the next level. And, and you know, so uh, being in a conference like ALT mm -hmm. is is really interesting for me because <clears throat> in many ways it, it's very familiar. When I look at the program uh, uh, and, and go to the sessions, I could easily see myself being in Orlando in sure. October, November. It, the, the theme and the thinking and the conversations I think are very similar. What strikes me, and I, I just came from a, a research uh, strand this morning, um, as an opportunity uh, for uh, Sloan C, uh, for ALT, and, and more personally for me being at Penn State in this new center, is the power of the collaboration, the, the uh, synergy that can be created by us joining forces. I'll give you an example. Um, we do small grants at Penn State uh, to faculty and staff and actually even to students that look at online innovation. And um, it, it, we've had two rounds. We, we're, we're not even a year old yet. Actually, today is, we are, we are a year and one day old. September 10th is our Happy birthday. Long. Thank you. And um, it just it struck me this morning in listening to this research strand that Boy, we, we need to be talking to this community. We need to be finding a way um, to connect our researchers to this broader entity. Because one thing becomes increasingly clear, that we can easily get locked down into thinking that our domain, our region, our institution is, is the hub of all thinking and such in this domain. And it is not anything, <laughs> but, uh, and I'm wondering if you're yeah. also, as you're moving about, do you see those opportunities? I, I, I do, and, and, uh, and to, be, um, to be very transparent, mm -hmm. one of the strategies that we've employed since, uh, since I assumed the leadership position uh, in Sloan C, which is typically how, what most people refer to us as, is that if we're going to move forward, we're going to do it in a collaborative fashion. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I've been particularly sensitive to reaching out. And in fact, uh, our engagement at the, the ALT conference, uh, and it was great to be invited and looking forward to our session later today, uh, came about when I met John Slater, 
uh, at Ascalite. We were both presenting, mm -hmm. he on Alt, and I was presenting on, on uh, Sloan C. And we sat next to each other and became, mm. uh, I think, the uh, down under term is mates. We <laughs> mates. became very uh, close mates and friends. began a conversation, yeah. good friends. Mm. Uh, we followed up following that conference, mm. and he said, uh, You really need to speak to Marin, oh. who's the head of uh, the equivalent executive officer. Mm. Uh, we had an initial phone call, and then mm. that has kind of mushroomed into uh, not only our being here, but uh, ongoing discussions about uh, collaborative efforts. Uh, we're here. She's uh, going to get to our meeting next year. Sure. She's scheduled that. So, uh, so I think you're right. I, I I love coming to conferences, and it does have, although it doesn't feel like Orlando here. Uh, it does the the, the conference proper. Mm -hmm. uh, you see similarities, and yet you see great differences. Yeah, you yeah. see. Uh, some stylistic differences in in uh, presentations and some of the research that's going on. Some of it mirrors some research that we have going on. And uh, but it's a great learning experience, and I uh, it's uh, it's been enjoyable. The, the the people have been very warm, yeah. and uh, it's been a great conference. So so transitioning a little bit yeah. to uh, to this afternoon's talk, we're going to be looking at. Um, sort of a, a snapshot of, of the forces of change in higher education mm -hmm. as part of our talk. And uh, this has grown out of uh, this six year, well going on six years now, of our Leadership Institute. And um, I've made an observation, and we've shared this offline as well, that the, the nature of these changes, the forces of these changes, uh, like a snowball rolling downhill have only accelerated over time. They seem to be faster. They seem to be larger in impact. You know, uh, MOOCs is not a small thing. MOOCs is a big thing and it's going to roll over you and that that sort of pressure that's created. And, and um, we, we observed this year at our institute, which had the face-to-face -face event at Penn State, uh, the level of preparedness of our participants has has bumped up. Mm -hmm. When we started five years ago, um, some of these things weren't even bubbling about at the time. And today now, uh, we seem to have mm -hmm. folks who are a little bit more oriented and sensitive to some of these forces. Has that been a yeah, shared I, observation? I, yeah, I, I think that's true. I, um, but I think there's a broader context, again, some points that we, we will make today, that the that the traditional paradigm of higher education, whether it is in the U.S. or internationally from the U.S. perspective, be it the U.K., the Middle East, uh, we were, we've been in Australia and New Zealand, as we mentioned, uh, has, has really changed. And, and I think we are uh, in, a, in a period of great transformation. Some call it revolution. I, I believe it's more evolutionary. Um, and you've heard me say this far too many times, but uh, I think one of our challenges as an organization, mm -hmm. you as a leader at Penn State, uh, or other leaders at institutions, is to create the best teaching and learning environments that we can for faculty to do their work mm -hmm. and for students to do theirs. And I can't imagine a scenario where some level of technology integration is, is not there. I, in fact, I think the vast majority of institutions would kind of take the University of Central Florida's approach and say, we don't offer anything but either blended or fully online programming. Right. And I think that leadership is is sensing that. And sure. uh, uh, you mentioned MOOCs. I wonder what a MOOC is. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, the, 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 the MOOC effort, I think, is, is driving some of this change. It has gotten... Uh, some of the elite institutions in the world either delivering free education, free programming, or at least thinking about doing sure. that. I, um, we're talking with a colleague from the UK and they're getting ready to launch Future Learn th mm -hmm. as part of the open uh, university system. So they're getting into the, mm -hmm. into the MOOC uh, activity and it is changing the thinking of institutions. It is changing the thinking of our policymakers, both at the federal and state level in the U.S. Um, one of our challenges, quite honestly, is people reading about MOOCs and thinking, oh, we can do this. Sure. It doesn't cost us anything to do it. It's sure, free, right. and you can serve 150,000 right. students. 
And in some fashion you can, but I think you would agree with me. Yeah. Don't leave me out on a limb on this one, Larry. Yeah. That uh, as great as the MOOC movement has been, sure. we would not view that as really high quality online learning unless there is some level of engagement, a set of support right. services, um, and obviously tied to credit. Right. It's not that they're, I mean, I think the MOOC activities, and both of us have been in MOOC courses, have been great. Yeah. But in terms of them being for academic credit, most of them do not have the kind of interaction uh, support services that we think are important. So I know our time has to be wrapping up now. Uh, and so I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I guess as I watch that phenomena, the MOOC phenomena as one, uh, it's so interesting to watch it. It may not be the final uh, um, product in the end, but it's certainly moving the ball down the field, to use it a is. sports metaphor. <clears throat> and uh, it certainly has got people's attention. And, and here at the ALT conference, which I've really enjoyed, I've enjoyed the interactions with the, uh, the faculty and the administrators I've been meeting um, Matter of fact, I just said to someone, a colleague, a couple minutes ago, I'm, I'm sorry I booked to leave early tomorrow. I, I wish I had stuck around a little bit because the conversations have really been good. Um, and, and I think it's a challenge. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, all of this is a challenge that, for me at least, and I, and I know this is for you as well, creates a, um, an energy and an excitement about how we can help shape and form uh, the future of learning. Uh, well, I, I, and I tend to be an optimist and not a pessimist, and I think every challenge creates an opportunity yeah. as well. And uh, I think the more we can learn from our colleagues in the UK and others from Europe, uh, literally or globally, uh, what is going on, uh, I think that it only speaks uh, better for what we're looking yeah. to do in our organization, what you're looking to do at Penn State, what we're looking to do with the Institute uh, uh, for emerging leadership and online learning, and um, five years down, and looking five years ahead, we'll, we'll continue. To it's always a pleasure. To nice to see you, Larry. Thanks My again. Pleasure. Thank you.